Sponsor conversation, Bobby Wilson, Black Geographies, and Clark University. <coughs> this initiative from Clark University graduate students in geography, CAGS, is organized with the support of the Office of Diversity and Inclusion and the Graduate School of Geography. This is a moderated QA panel where our distinguished guests will do us the honor of reacting to our prompts. My colleague, Maddie Crude, PhD candidate in the Human Environment Research Cluster, and me, Giselle Villa Benitez, coming from the same cluster, will be guiding this Q&A. On behalf of CAGS, we welcome you and thank you for coming. We have three motivations for convening this panel. First, to remember illustrious geography alum Bobby Wilson, who pioneered the field of black geographies. We want to spotlight his legacy, reflecting on his many contributions to black geographies, among other cognitive fields, and to provoke conversations with human environment geography broadly understood. Dr. Wilson grew up on a farm in Warrington, North Carolina, where his responsibilities on the farm shaped his character and strength. It was also in Warrington that, his, that he participated in the struggle for civil rights in the early 1960s. He would attend North Carolina Central University, NCCU, one of the few historically black colleges offering an undergraduate degree in geography. The geography department at NCCU was founded and chaired by Dr. Theodore Spiner, the first African American to earn a PhD in conservation, who in turn encouraged, encouraged his students like Wilson to pursue graduate study. After earning his bachelor in geography at NCCU, Wilson attended Clark University, earning a master in 1973 and a PhD in 1974. His advisor was Professor Annette Vladimir Grover, who was, and he was writing a dissertation entitled The Influence of Church Participation on the Behavior in Space of Black Rural Immigrants Within Bedford Stuyvesant, a Social Space Analysis. Later, he will publish notable works, including America's Johannesburg, Industrialization and Racial Transformation in Birmingham, and Race and Place in Birmingham, The Civil Rights and Neighborhood Movements, published in 2000. These books are highly regarded in various disciplines from urban studies to economic geography for their clear analysis of the spatial dimensions of race and exploitation of black labor during industrialization. Our second aim is to encourage a closer engagement with black geographies. Perhaps not all of us work in this field. In brainstorming for this panel, Maddie and I discussed how we felt that black geographies and black scholarship are not always found at the center of the canon of both geography as a whole and the GSG specifically, and how we don't want to reproduce those disconnections in our future scholarly work. Looking forward, we want to understand what can be gained by thinking with blackness as a geographical framework, and how this engagement may expand our practices and commitments. Finally, we pose these questions coming from a specific place. Clark University's private school of geography has been acknowledged for its contribution to radical thinking, with scholars such as Wilson clearly defining that path. We ask, how can we further our commitments in this vein, both in terms of scholarly contributions and in relation to nurturing a diverse community of practice? To help us think about these questions, we have a fantastic panelist joining us today. Dr. Alex Moulton, assistant professor in the Department of Sociology at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville, and Clark, PhD, alum. Previously, he taught at Middle Tennessee State University and the University of the West Indies, Jamaica. His scholarship and pedagogy combine insights from black ecology and geography, environmental sociology, critical race theory, and political ecology. He's a researcher, writer, podcaster, educator, amateur geographer, and proud father, with a regional focus on the Caribbean. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming Alice. Clark and you came back, they gave you introductions like that. So, <laughs> yeah, come back next week. <laughs> I, I have a lot to 
say and to hopefully invite you to think about with me. Um, the other person who's supposed to be on the panel um, is not here, and I think that robs us of some of the um, really important discussions that we would have otherwise had, um, specifically around the impact of the relationship between Bobby Wilson and Ruth Wilson Gilmore um, for clarifying critical um, geographies, black geographies. Um, what I want to do before getting into um, a talk that I presented in lieu of what would have been a panel conversation is a few slides. So this is Bobby, um, and um, this is a, one of the last images that he um, took. Um, uh, his department at the time, University of Alabama, Tuscaloosa, um, was, uh, took these photos to celebrate Bobby's award at the time. Um, uh, he was awarded a Lifetime Achievement Award by the discipline, and so these photos were taken. Uh, that's Bobby with a red box over there, back in his days, the Coxian. And um, that's Bobby there, too. And this is uh, Bobby introduces himself in the first record that he appears in the Monadna. <coughs> As I will say a little bit more about in my talk, this introduction, which might seem to us to be rather benign, was pretty radical articulation, countering the sort of general tenor of the talk at the time. Um, again, Bobby, and standing, to, standing next to him is, is Dick Pete, um, a friendship and relationship that was um, very interesting and formative in, in ways that we won't necessarily have the time and space to discuss today. And then this is Bobby, um, uh, at, you know, recorded in, in the kind of service he was doing, um, helping to edit the Monadna. And I thought this particular reference was pretty cool because a few years ago, um, Judy Dorkin and um, yeah, Judy Dorkin visited, and um, we got to talk with her and Dan about you know the ways in which their geographies um, sort of. Um, played out, and uh, for those who don't know, Judy went on to leave formal academia and work as an activist and a uh, legal scholar supporting um, indigenous folks in um, the Midwest. And, and so that's, that's Bobby. All right. So um, I'm going to try to be quick, but to go slow enough to um, to these comments that I've prepared. Fred Donaldson's 1969 assessment of the discipline of geography's attention to black spatial matters was that, quote, profound social problems in America seem to have eluded most geographers, end quote. More pointedly, Donaldson opined, opined that, quote, concerning its treatment of the black American, the nature of geography is misinformation or no information at all. The purpose of this paper is to show that the field of geography has contributed to the maintenance of white supremacy over Afro-Americans although not discussed here, an equally good case might be made for Indians and other non-white groups. This is still for Donaldson, end quote. <laughs> Donaldson pointed out how even with increasing engagements with the then emerging field of environmental perception research, geographical scholarship had not considered the possibility of black environmental perception. In an early suggestion about the nature of racialized epistemology and experiences of space, Donaldson argued for attention to how use and structuring of space differed among um, the dominant white America and marginalized black Americans. Donaldson surveyed the six the, the sixth fifth grade te geography textbooks of the era, the six most prominent textbooks of the era, and his assessment of five of them is thus. Range from bad to worse to white supremacists in their coverage of the black man in America, end quote. His analysis bears this out with excerpts from each of the texts, as for geography journals, Donaldson recounts that up to the point of his writing in 1969, there were 13 articles in a combined 54 years of publication represented by the major geography journals, Economic Geography, the, geography Re the Geographical Review, and the Annals. He said, quote, when the occurrence of articles is plotted by year, there is no indication that recent social developments have influenced geographic literature, end quote. Sears' methodological and epistemological problems limited the value of the 13 articles. This is his assessment. What is the role of discrimination in accounting for black residential pattern? How can we write about the black ghetto without being teleological? Why is it important to critically compare the environmental goods and harms in black and white communities? 
These are some of the questions that Donaldson asks. He ends the paper with four recommendations and this charge. Quote, it is time that geographers, as social scientists and educators, refrain from spreading the historical geographical facts concerning the black Americans as a fable of greed of pine, end quote. So, why begin a reflection on Bobby Wilson, black geographers in Clark University in this way? Why spend the time on Donaldson's assessment? Well, Donaldson was writing in volume one, issue one of Clark University, um, the, the, the journal Antipode that was organized by grad students and faculty here at Clark University. In the editorial essay for that first issue, that inaugural issue titled Positions, Purposes, and Pragmatics, David Stay um, said that the, the aims of Antipode were, quote, our goal is to is radical change, replacement of institutions and institutional arrangements in our society that can no longer respond to the societal needs, that stifle attempts to provide us with a more viable pattern for living, that often serve no other purpose than perpetuating themselves. We do not seek to replace existing institutions with others which will inevitably take the form of the former. Rather, we look to a new ordering of means in accordance with a new set of goals." End quote. So, one of the first reasons then, or the first reason then, to turn to Donaldson as a way to talk about Wilson and Clark geography is to notice that the emergence of radical geography, um, the question of black geography, um, and its importance for the discipline were central and coterminous. Right? At the very time that Antipode as the articulation of <coughs> radical geography was taking form, black geography was, was being articulated. Um, and that radical geography was being articulated as a response to those tensions. So the motivations for radical geography were in part motivated by the kinds of questions of black life, the civil rights movement, the reproduction of race and equality, through urban political economy, knowledge and representation. To the extent that this relationship between black geographies and Clark, or black geographers and Clark, is, is, is radically obscured, Donaldson's article, I believe, then serves as an important way to correct for historiography of geography, but then also of black geography. The second reason I want to begin with this detour through, through Donaldson is, is that just three years later, Bobby Wilson, writing in what would be his first publication um, with uh, a co-authored piece with um, Herman Jenkins, another black uh, student here, um, would, would ask a similar question to the kinds of questions posed by Donaldson. In that, in that piece, in this, in this second issue of Antipode, um, Bobby Wilson and Herman Jenkins asks this question, can geography as a set of concepts and tools, we have relevance in solving the problems of the black American community. The Antipode essay um, that the two co-authored was a revision of an article originally published by Jenkins um, in the Monotna. Um, with the exception of a few more pointed phrases or turns of phrases in sentences and a paragraph or two at the end, the essay is essentially the same. And this is also important to notice that the sort of original articulation um, that in this essay that a lot of people point to as being you know, co-produced by Bobby and Herman, in fact, owes a lot to Herman. And we don't know a lot about Herman. I've tried to track Herman down. And with you know, discussion with the folks here suggests that there might be some new resources to do that. So that's what I decide. But I think it's epistemologically important to, to cite. Right. So, so uh, in, the, in, this, in this essay um, that, that is published in Antipode, Wilson and Jenkins noted that the question was the, the, the question that had been bubbling up in discussions by black students in the Graduate School of Geography. Um, and of course, these questions, because they were bubbling up, led to the uh, symposium on blacks in geography. And so reporting um, on the nature of these questions, both of them say, uh, quote, implicit in the conflicts that sometimes occur between black students and departmental faculty and administrators here at Clark is this question of how do you reconcile black geographies with geography? So, so that Wilson and Jen Jenkins critiques um, was that um, of what they saw as the dominant geographical imagination, quote, um, which was dominated by a white epistemological framework and what they went on to name in this formative essay as the black imagination. Um, so, so this definition um, of a geographical imagination and a black um, imagination was really a first articulation of black geographies. And in this essay, Wilson and Jenkins suggest that there is a tension, a quote, inconsistency between the black imagination and the geographic imagination. 
In this framing, then, Wilson and Jenkins argue not simply for more geographers who are black, but for black geographers and black people's epistemologies and research agendas to be taken seriously in ways that will reshape geography and the way that the discipline is reproduced. This nascent black geography was concerned not just with disciplinary inclusion, but with sensitivity to the ways in which black social problems would be critically understood in relation to black people's spaces and movements. And so theirs was a black geography that was interested in the ways that black geographic community was reproduced, both um, in the way research was conducted, but also in the nature of interdepartmental relationships. So as they noted at this, this path-breaking symposium that was convened here at Clark, um, black geographers addressed themselves, this is a quote, black geographers addressed themselves to the profession as an organized group or as an individual. That's the question. Right? And they said that this question remained uh, unresolved. So in his own research, Wilson would demonstrate the analytical and epistemological purchase of the black imagination for understanding the constitution of black community, black spaces, and black geographies of mobility. And this is, of course, exemplified in his, er in, in his earliest published essay outside of Antipode, um, titled Church Participation, um, a Social Space Analysis in a Community of Black in Migrants. The paper was an outcome of his dissertation, which was supervised by Anne Bottomer in most of the Monadna um, uh, issues she's referred to as Sister Anne, um, which, I, for those of you who know the history, she was a nun, so that's, that, uh, sorry, okay. Uh, so let me get back to this. Um, so so in, in, the, in this essay, um, uh, uh, Wilson uses the church, the black church, as an institution of symbolic and social self-conception to examine the ways in which social space is reproduced and navigated through um, their self-identifications and evaluations with regard to a reference group, elite blacks and white. So Wilson argues for a framework that explores the relationship between the socio-psychological, or the black epistemology and poetics, on the one hand, and the ways in which those socio-psychological expressions are um, spatialized through behaviors, um, and so on. So, so black geographies then, conceived by Wilson in the earliest of his papers, consists of the mappings of what he would say, quote, meaning contexts of the black lived experience, the efforts to, quote, establish some degree of symmetry between his inner self and reflected in the um, subjective dimension of social space and external behavior in space, in space portrayed in the objective dimension of social space. So it's kind of clunky language, but this is language of the time. So Wilson uses the study's findings to warn that, quote, the black community, from a geographical perspective, cannot be studied as a monolithic group, which has been in the, which, which has been in the, in, in, in the past. Um, he argues for, quote, microanalysis, which is needed to, quote, discern possible variations in socio-spatial processes and forms. So again, there's another long quote here, which I'm realizing we might not have time for, or maybe we do. This is about me. We can spend the time. So furthermore, he argues, quote, in areas of community development, policymakers have failed to take advantage of communities' reference systems. In practical decisions are often made by planners, politicians, etc., that result in changes in the physical and socioeconomic structures of black communities. Programs responsible for such change have, in most instances, disrupted the social reference system of communities. And here I think he's writing at a time where, you know, urban you know, state-sanctioned urban displacement and racism is taking place, right? Uh, so today, we might understand what, what Wilson is saying, um, at what he's referring to as a black community reference system, as a black sense of place, right? We, we might understand this as an epistemology that was shaped by social and spatial references and experiences mediated by institutions that were formative for black communities such as the church. In the processes that, that Bobby is unpacking, the role of associational relationships versus communal intergroup relationships are, are central to the reconstitution of the black self following the Great Migration. This is why he focused on Ed Stuy, for example. So Wilson's dissertation and the research um, by the, the few other black geographers at the time, if we recall Donaldson's um, um, earlier argument, are important precisely for the way that they challenge the prevailing approaches to geography and valorize black geographers and the black geographic experience, both as something contained within grad school, but as life. Right? And so, in, in their essay, Matt Huber, Chris Knudsen, and Renee Tapu is in the, in the audience, um, in an essay titled, in a chapter titled Radical Paradoxes, 
the making of antipodic art geography. They remind us that the kind of work that would have been that, that Bali was doing would have been counter-radical at Clark, and I can explain why I use that phrasing later, precisely because of the influence of Walter Elmer Ekblom, a student of Ellen Churchill Semple, in 1926, who would go on to supervise one-third of all the PhDs in the Graduate School of Geography over two decades. Um, so this meant that the dissertations he supervised totaled more than the number of doctoral theses of any other U.S. geography program with the exception of Wisconsin and Chicago. A student of the church or something. We can get then a sense of how these kinds of questions that Bobby was asking, or just declaring and asserting through his <coughs> research interests, related to the tensions that were shaping Clark geography and its relationship not only to students in residence, but to alumni. We can get a sense of this from um, the uh, notes of the uh, director of the graduate school at the time, Sam, um, Sam, um, Saul B. Cohen, um, in his remarks for the 1970 issue of the Monadna, so the issue between the Donaldson essay and the symposium here at Clark. Um, in that issue of the Monadna, um, Cohen reflected on the 50th anniversary of the establishment of the program. So I'm trying to suggest something about temporalities here. So 50 years ago, roughly, um, Cohen reflected um, thus. I can say with some confidence to all of you that 1970-71, the 50th anniversary of the founding of the School of Geography, will see us well prepared to meet the next quarter of a century as a unique geographical institution. Our commitment to geography at Clark will be within a multi and interdisciplinary context, and the lines of communication among students and faculty are open. He goes on to note that, quote, many alumni are not thinking of disciplines or programs these days. They're thinking about the viability of the university as an institution. They're asking questions about the basic goals and objectives of higher education. They're probing the implications of student and faculty activism and the role of the university, um, the, the role the university should play with respect to such issues as environment, prejudice, and more. These concerns about the future of the department, the relationship of the alumni to the department, and how these things were being affected by the acrimonies that Wilson and Jenkins were alluding to seem to have been weighing very heavily on Cohen. In his message, he goes on to caution that he is not against free expression that can, well, let me, let me rephrase that. He, go, he goes on to caution against free expression, quote, free expression that can bring with it extremisms that place the university in institutional jeopardy. Cohen does also warn, importantly, about limiting free debate. But in the end, Cohen Tones strikes a balance, or attempts to strike a balance, between asking alumni, students, and faculty not to be deferential to Clark, but to believe in the promise of the GSG and to remain committed to its ideal for scholarship. This was also to be the tone of Cohen's remarks in his 1971 director's message in the Manatma. Yet it was precisely the matter of how difference and racialized inequalities were being accounted for or not accounted for in the history of the GSG that Cohen was celebrating and the vision that he was setting out that concerned Wilson, Jenkins, and Collins. So to be sure, I want to be very clear about this because I wasn't present there, so I have to go by the records. So to be sure, the very presence of black geography at Clark owed enormous uh, um, you know, credit to Cohen. Um, and one does get the sense, reading through all the documents, that he is deeply, deeply concerned about cultivating an inclusive space. He agonizes over, over all that is taking place on campus, including other departments who were not happy that geography was trying to integrate. So that is, that is really important for Cohen's legacy. But Cohen was, a, was, a, was, was not only professor here. Between 1963 and 65, he was secretary of the AAG and becomes president of the AAG in 69. So in his position with the AAG, Cohen established the American Association of Geographers Commission on Geography and Afro-American, Cohen establishes the American Association of Geographers Commission on Geography and Afro-Americans, HONGA, uh, that's the acronym. He also tried to increase black American graduate student enrollment at Clark through Clark's teacher, teacher training teachers triple T program. It was through a combination of these programs and internal fellowships that Bobby Wilson was recruited and retained. Bobby was actually retained, um, recruited on one fellowship which lost money because Cohen couldn't secure follow-up funding from the people who initially committed that. So 
again, all this to say, Cohen is deeply committed and like worked magic to get people at the body graduated. Um, but all that's important, right? Um, in, in the single author version of the essay on the symposium, um, the one published before the, the co written antipo rewrite, Herman Jenkins raised some serious questions about retention, which, which might help us get a glance of what's taking place. Um, Jenkins recounted that the last session at the symposium um, was focused on Clark. So they, there was a general discussion about blacks in geography, and then there was a pointed discussion about Clark. And um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be reading quotes here from, from Herman. I want to be invited back to my alma mater. Um, so <laughs> Jenkins says this, there's a good chance that no, no new black students will be coming to Clark's department in the fall of 72. Out of the 10 or so black students presently in the department, perhaps only two or three will be back in the fall of 72. We know at least one did because Bobby graduated. The point was made, this is still a quote, that Clark, that the point was made that Clark's image has become one of Clark being a school that blacks can get into but cannot get out of with a degree, end quote. So a committee was formed in response to this critique constituted by Martin Bo uh, Bowden, Ann Bottomer, Bobby, and Herman himself. And the committee was formed to examine the creation of a course on, quote, black perspectives in either cultural or social geography. This would have been the first black geographies course in the United States, possibly the discipline. I've not verified if the course was created, um, and I've not also verified whether the recommendation to have a special issue in the AAG was, was taken up. That's something that Mona and I would talked about earlier. We're going to try to do that work. Um, but what is worth noting is that the formation of the committee suggests that there was good faith in the department to really think about these things. So, I'm going to shut up now. As we reflect on the GSG, 50 years since these questions were posed, um, and 50 years since the assessments of Bobby and Herman were used to, to, to evoke a reckoning. We know that Clark does go on to become a multi and interdisciplinary space that the coin envisioned. We know that Clark continues to be famous. But the same has not necessarily been true for the space of black geographies or black geographers as would have been envisioned by Wilson and Jenkins. Though there has certainly been great strides in other critical, um, by other critical alumni in the development of robust racial geographies and, 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 um, and other you know, critical work on difference, the kinds of numbers that Jenkins and, and Wilson were concerned with seeing here did not materialize. So, as we close, or as I close, as I close, I want to restate a proposition from Wilson and Jenkins' article from 50 years ago <coughs> to maybe gesture us towards a conversation about the next 50 years. Quote, black graduate students at Clark we might say every other department, are very much concerned with the integrity that the geography department has towards the black community. With the government trying to enforce this integrity through monetary means, there is a strong incentive for the geography department to increase black enrollment. However, the problem is not the quantity of blacks in any department, but the quality of the relationship that will have to exist between the two imaginations, between the dominant geographical imagination and the black imagination. There is no set rules for, bring, for bridging this gap. However, it does involve sincerity on the part of both imaginations, and it does involve sitting down and discussing openly the pertinent problems. Thank you. Testing, testing. All right, I uh, hope you weren't serious about shutting up now, because you're still our star panelist. <laughs> <laughs> So we'll do a sort of a couple of sort of questions that she and I have drafted in advance, and then we'll open it up uh, to the audience for questions. So I'll, I'll talk for a 30 seconds so you can catch your breath. Um, so we sort of were thinking about these questions, uh, as she said, around thinking about Bobby Wilson and his scholarship and his legacy as an alum of Clark, um, the broader field of black geographies, and then lastly, Clark itself, the GSG, black geographies and praxis. Um, and I think you've given us a very good, well-rounded research bit on Bobby. Uh, so we'll set those questions aside, and we can get back to those in the Q&A if folks have more uh, specific questions about Bobby Wilson and his legacy. Um, 
but I guess in the sort of style of the previous panels, I was wondering if you could sort of reflect on your own experience as a grad student at Clark, um, and how you found your way here to start building your scholarship, your activism, and your various commitments as a scholar. Trying to get me disinvited. I'm kidding. <laughs> I had an amazing time here. I, I've gone on to, this is a slight, this is a slight note, I've gone on to publish now papers with at least five cohort mates and other people that I was in school with here at Clark, including Dylan in the room back here. Um, and at least three of those were my Cubs buddies. So the person who was my older Cubs buddy and my younger Cubs buddy are both folks. So I, I say that to open my own reflections at my time by, by you know, suggesting something of the enormously collegial and um, generative relationships that I continue to have with people in my cohort from the course before. One of the things Dylan and I were reflecting on last night is one of our former grad students whose name is worth putting into the record, Miles Kenny Lazar, who was very prolific in applying for grants, would not hesitate to share every single application he drafted for every single grant. Um, and so that meant that we have, we have an archive internally within the, 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 the graduate school for all of us seeking applications uh, for next year. So stuff like that. Um, I think about when um, I had a concussion I needed to be taken to the doctor and people in my cohort volunteered um, and did that. Um, people got me groceries. So, I, I, you know, while I couldn't do that. And so I, I think those relationships for me uh, made Clark not just, you know, tenable or bearable, as bad as the winters were, but enjoyable. <laughs> um, and I, I think that um, I reflect upon my time here very fondly because I was, you know, a Jamaican guy just showed up. I was like, I don't know what theory is. Uh, I didn't know that was a thing you had to do to be a geographer. So, and then Jody was like, go read Sylvia Winter and don't come back until you do. And, you know, and, and really forced me and encouraged me to think. Um, the first time I, I came to visit, Tony had just been inducted into the National Academy. And I walked into my, his office thinking, you know, there's going to be a halo and, you know, music in the background. And he's like, yeah, come on in, come on in. You know, and it was just the most chill. And I was like, there is no way these people are actually as famous as they are. <laughs> it's nice. You know, Dan was like, yeah, let's go for a walk. And, like, everyone was just in, in immensely welcoming. And so from the get-go, um, I, I did like my time here. And the, the last thing I'll say in response to this question, which, which I can't avoid saying, um, I'd be disingenuous if I didn't say it, is um, when I was here um, in, in 2017, I believe, we had a, a forum in the department on diversity and inclusion. I was provoked by some of the broader conversations on the campus community. And um, whereas others of us who were organizing in other departments were called into meetings and told, I remember you're here to get a degree, uh, be faithful to that and calm down, don't do this after this stuff. I remember um, Tony, who was director at the time, called me and Janae Davis into his office, um, and he said, I want you to know that you have the department's full total support. And at every single one of those meetings where graduate students across the campus and undergrads showed up to demand more diversity, inclusion, um, responsiveness from the administration, uh, we could count on geographers and geography professors being present to count on their support. So I think all that to say that these tensions that I'm inviting us to think about are not an indictment, or, or not only an indictment of Clark, uh, but are really an invitation to think about how the tremendous promise and energy that has already always been bubbling up in Clark has always anticipated the need to carve more just futures. And maybe on the uh, sharing proposals thing, I earlier, I maybe should have shared that I based my DDRI application in part off of yours and Dylan's. Um, but Yuko was going to make them available to a proposal writing seminar. You were so. she wrote that email for. Yeah. <laughs> I remember that. I was like, sure. Why not? Uh, anyway, so I think that uh, your last point uh, is a good sort of jumping off point then for thinking now that you're AMS, an early career scholar, so what are some of the, the pressing challenges but also the opportunities for other higher education institutions to make space for black geographies, black geographies and black geographers and other faculty of color in the sort of African Academy. This is supposed to be a fun panel. All these <laughs> questions. So I'm, I'm at I'm at the University of Tennessee, which 
which I think is, is a good way to just answer that question. Okay. Um, yes. But, <laughs> more seriously, um, I, I think that the promise of black geographies is that it invites us to think critically about how difference is articulated, normalized, and reproduced through everyday practices, quotidian practices that are discounted and depoliticized. And that is the stuff of like part geography, attending to those questions, whether it's conservation, whether it's you know, urban economic processes. So I think that black geography is, is a kind of, it's a reef and it is disrupting flow. And I think that we can respond to that disruption by, I'm gonna use some metaphors here, running the ship aground, the geography ship aground, and seeing who survives. Or we can slow down and critically reassess how we constitute spaces and how we discipline ourselves into this thing that I think most of us think is like a calling, right? All geographers think this is a calling. So I think that, that that's, for me, what geography, black geographies can do. It can, it can disrupt us through its inclusion. And unless, of course, its inclusion is predatory inclusion, like what I think Bobby and, and Donaldson were, were critiquing, right? I think if we, if we take black geographies seriously, or feminist, indigenous geographies, queer geographies, seriously, any of these geographies, if we take them seriously, they are disruptive of what is normal, traditional, canonical. And that opens up space for us to see voices that have been silenced that are absolutely generative for our future. I'm gonna shut up soon. But Dylan and I, Dylan and I were talking about this last night. Dylan and I talked a lot. So Dylan and I were talking, and there's this, there's this philosopher that Jody Emo introduced us to, Sylvia Winter. And every single paper that Dylan and I write these days has a Sylvia Winter quote. And she's this otherwise obscured feminist thinker. But only at a place like Clark is a thinker like that, so central, has to, has to become the, the motivating factor beyond, behind like five dissertations in one cohort, <laughs> right? We have one last question prepared, and then we can start to the audience. And I guess we owe you one fun question. Um, <laughs> so sort of taking a step back, um, so G mentioned that we're both coming from the human environment cluster. Uh, we work in political ecology, broadly defined. Um, so what gets you excited? So where, are the, where do you see the exciting points of intersection emerging with black geographies, with human environment geographies, with political ecology, land use, land change, and others? You know, where do you see those exciting points of intersection you know, where should clubs be looking for, you know, where, where are you excited to see the papers coming out of? Um, and where do you see space for deeper engagement? And take notes in the audience, clubs members, looking for final paper comments. That's, that's a total no pressure question. No, yeah. Uh, that's a good question. <laughs> we sent them to you ahead of time. Yeah. I, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, so. But, um, yeah, no, I, I, I don't know that I, I still don't have an answer for that. I think <laughs> that the work that is in the vein of critical intersectional work, I really like the phrase Dan used earlier, an epistemology of allies, and thinking about work now being done by at the intersection of black and indigenous geographies, which is changing how we think about blackness, how we think about indigeneity, how we think about Afro-indigeneity, how we think about being, you know, um, um, a person from, from, from the Western Hemisphere who's non-white in multiplicities of ways and how those cultural geographies are different. I think that that kind of work is, is where I see some cross. There's a really amazing um, work now about disability and how environmental inequality and um, social inequality is disabling. I think that that is really productive and really makes the future more accessible to um, a diverse array of people. So I think the promise of that, that kind of intersectional work, that work based on this epistemology of allyship, is that it allows the full spectrum of how being human is expressed and experienced to now realize the ideal of humanism and humanistic geography. Um, 
for moving on to uh, Q and A with you. So we're opening the floor. Easy questions. <laughs> <laughs> or if you have a comment, an experience to share at this one. My name is Roman Hensel, and I would like to get your opinions on the current um, situation regarding the governor of Florida, Robert DeSantis, and his blocking of the AP for the African American Studies at the um, university level in Florida. Uh, I will share with you and anybody else who wants it a public syllabus that I've co-designed with Toya Eves and Adam Bledsoe, um, and in that syllabus, basically all the people who DeSantis didn't want on the AP curriculum, we found their most accessible articles, we found their most accessible chapters, we found the, the free PDFs, and we made a public syllabus for folks to use as a resource. Um, I think that's the kind of response to people like DeSantis, and I also think that, um, you know, again, because I'm teaching in a state that some of my, my teaching is by law illegal, um, it's called, you know, because of the divisive concepts legislation, right? That we, we have to be honest with our, our students, we have to be honest with people we work with, and we also have to do the work of translating all the stuff that we do outside academia. I think sometimes we publish papers and it's like we're 10, you know, we're 10 Facebook friends who read them, and I think that that is a serious limitation because people like the scientists can control the narrative because no one's going to go behind a paywall. And so public scholarship is really important, and co-produced scholarship um, is important. I know a lot of geographers in the, um, the Black Geography Specialty Group and in uh, other related um, specialty groups have been doing public forums. In Knoxville, we did one with um, the local Methodist Church, um, where the you know, population, the demographics is older, white, more affluent from the side of town that sees the black side of town as maybe other. We did a public forum there. We went through what, what, what are we talking about when we say critical race theory? What are we talking about when we say environmental justice? What, are, what, what do these phrases, concepts mean in the way we do our work? And we made sure that the people who did that were also people who were people of faith, who could translate that into something that the audience could understand. And there was no pressure to ask stupid or not stupid questions. There was no pressure to ask politically correct questions. People are invited to ask any question and to really get an answer. And so stuff like that. And, and yeah, and, and some days I tell my students, you know, this is illegal knowledge. And uh, I'm pretty happy sharing that because I'm a clerk. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Dylan, if no one else raises their hand. <laughs> Me and I just, we could just talk. I actually just give him the mic, we just talk. Thanks, so. uh, Yeah, Mike Cecil, a, a sixth year PhD student. Um, I guess what I hear a bit is just that while um, sort of the study of black geography is becoming more prevalent, it is still somewhat distinct from some of the other branches. Uh, I was wondering if you just, of the other, I was wondering if you had. Any thoughts just in terms of improving this integration? Like, what what questions should be asked? Uh, just should a geographer be asking generally? That's um, you know that wants to sort of do some of this this bridge, bridging essentially, or or even any you know um, like sort of uh, you know writings that that might help with that. I'm going to give you an easy, an easy answer, and there's a much more complicated answer. But this is the answer, easy answer. The same work, more reflexively. Uh, there, there's, there's no faucet of geography today that black geographers and black geographers have not been speaking to. We think about the future and modeling, as people like Dylan working with black geographers and, and other people like me, hopefully, are showing, is that the way modeling and the way we do climate science and we imagine surviving the apocalypse of the plantation of sea, right, those kinds of research projects should invite serious consideration of who the human is and who is expected to survive. We're talking about urban geographer, geographies, and I, I would defer to some of the experts here. We're talking about urban economic geographies. How is inequality reproduced? 
not through adding in race as a variable to control for or to account for, but how, how is economic inequality produced through or in relationship to the social construction of race? How is the spatialization of race necessary for the stabilization of certain economic structures that prop up race as if it were, you know, sort of natural and inevitable and tele teleological, right? So that, that's that, right? We, if we think about um, any other geographer, geographies, uh, you know, I don't know, anyone, right? We can go down and we can do the same kind of thing. How can the same questions that we're being asked, that we're asking, be asked more reflexively to, to account for work epistemological blind sets, blind spots, and also how work frameworks and methodologies, if they are not reflexive, automatically disconcert such knowledges, right? In the same way if you were in the 1960s or 70s doing you know, economic geographies research and you want to talk to the head of household, you were missing maybe everything that was important. But your methodology was built on something that would systematically discount. So you could have asked any question and it still would not have gotten at women because your epistemology and methodology was just, it, 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 the path dependencies, James's uh, phrase earlier, meant that you could not know what you were hopefully trying to know. And so I think what that Jacques does is suggest that there are always already certain kinds of uh, uh, important questions of power in how we come to know and what we want to know and how we go about knowing it. And by being attentive to that, we can then recuperate methods, epistemologies, and approaches that, because they're more reflexive, can better attend to the realities. And I think, you know, the last thing I'll say is that people like Catherine McKittrick and so on have said that black geographies is not, you know, important because it is some absented, suppressed knowledge that we can now newly discover and just be like, oh my god, this is fine, and like run with it. Right? That the, the value of that geography is, is that it, it suggests that we take these questions seriously to the point that they become not about integration necessarily, but about profound transformations of or vocabularies and or ways of seeing being known. Thank you, Alice. That was a great talk. And uh, I'm Melissa Gilbert. And so I was chair of what we call a co chair of CUGS <coughs> back when. And so we live at NWC. I know. <laughs> so it's awesome to see all of you here. And um, I just, um, I, I think that um, one of the things that concerns me is that, you know, Bobby was pretty marginalized. Um, in geography, I was in um, I was in Atlanta um, for a while, and um, you know Bobby was really amazing at welcoming Clarkies to the region, and, and um, there were a few of us, uh, but he was very marginalized, um, and you know so was Clyde Woods. Um, so Clyde was um, never hired in the geography department. Neither with Bobby. Um, I'm really concerned about that, um, and I think that you know, there's a there's a lot of. I think the other panel is talking about people institutions and these kinds of things, and I think it's really really important that um, we all think in our own institutions about the ways in which you know at the same time that you know folks are being really recognized through the AAG and other ways that, you know, that we need to do sort of more of that in real time um, and ensuring that our, our own departments um, do better. Yeah. So. And, I mean, since I'm going to use your, your comment as a way to talk about this that I wasn't going to talk about, but, you know, let's just do it. Let's just do it. Well, well, I was wondering. I was going to ask you. So I was going to ask you later. But. Oh, I mean, yeah. You know, but I, I, yeah, but it struck. I have to say, it really struck me, and I and said this one. Um, there was uh, Laura had or, Laura had organized a session for Clay, uh, and I was like, Laura, he was never in the geography department. He was never hired in the geography department, and I know he applied. Well, and and the the so <laughs> the, the people right? now who are being tenured as associate professors in this this first new modern cohort, visible cohort of black geographies, 
are all people who otherwise, I believe, um, would should have been tenured already. Like you have people being tenured now because of things like because they were not hiring departments or because departments were not amenable to black geographies had to move. So you have people who've been, you know, yeah, I don't want to name specific people, yeah, like, but you know, we, I think we all know, we read Black Jack, those of us who read this stuff, like you have people who are just getting tenure after three institutions, they're black geographers in Florida, I won't name any particular schools, <coughs> but who have now moved three times and are still assistant professors. There are black geographers who, again, some of the leading people whose books are, like, came out last week, again, if you know, you know, um, yeah, are in yeah. sociology departments. I'm in a sociology department. I, I, I applied for for, for, for geography jobs. And I think that it's a serious question. It's a, it's a question about institutionalization, but also, you know, there is something to be said that Bobby's CDAC award was posthumous. Mm -hmm. And Bobby spent 40 plus years and attended every single CDAC meeting, barring health complications, and served on a bunch of CDAC, you know, panels, committees, and so on. Published when he could have published every, anywhere else, published big, major stuff, like not a throwaway paper, in the Southeastern Geographer. Bobby's Act of Achievement Award was posthumous. The, the special forum we organized was great, but you know, that, that's, that's posthumous too, right? And, and so all that to say that, you know, well, and I, well I'm just gonna say this. So there is, there is something called Geographers on Film, which, archives the leading geographers of the 20th century and to my count, and I can be corrected, Harold Rose, who was at the time president of the AG, so it would have been very bad if he was not included, and one other black person, are the only persons who apparently were geographers changing the 20th century, who were black. There are a few other people of color, Yu Fu Tuan is there, right? Um, but so, so that says a lot too about how Geography institutionalizes its memory of who's important. So I, I, this is something that I've been thinking about. I've recently suggested that to some of the folks in black geographies that the specialty group do an assessment to see the average to tenure process for um, folks. And then there's also the fact that any black geography scholar in any department is going to be the scholar that does all of the diversity stuff. But yeah, again, yeah, it depends right. on how open we want to have the conversation. <laughs> you're, you're, you're absolutely right. And during these times, in many places, um, certainly within public education of austerity, yeah. um, it's, it's challenging. challenging. Yeah. It's, def it's definitely challenging. Um, but having said that, I just, when you, I, it, I mean, I just heard you speak for the first time and, and, and where you are. And, you know, the entire time I was thinking about, you know, Bobby didn't have a job. Like I said, I was in the CDAG. CDAG was my own special place. Um, I don't know, maybe it's different now. I don't want to get anybody upset. But, you know, it was it was not an easy place to be. Um, as anybody doing anything beyond what was even traditional geography. And, and again, hi. So I think it's something we all need to sort of Think about in our institutions. Yeah. Well, and I just the, want to make that comment. Catherine, Catherine McKittrick is not in a geography department. <laughs> so I think there is that really, really important question. And I, I, I mean, and I'm not just saying this because they're here, but in, in the last year, at least, you know, Dartmouth and, and Mariana at, at Hunter, um, uh, UCLA, um, Florida State, um, i trying to remember. Uh, East Carolina have all had searches where they name oh. <laughs> and, and Temple um, have named position for which they're seeking uh, as a black geographer's position. And I think that that kind of gesture is really good endorsement that this is not a fad and that you can't just like tack it on. So like we want someone who does all these things and black geographers is like one of the 15 things. I think that that kind of, by saying yeah, black geographers your thing, we want you here, we want, you know, we want someone who specializes in this and to contribute to the department, and that kind of stuff is really, really uh, good endorsement. So, I don't, I don't think about any of this stuff regularly, right? <laughs> <laughs> One last question. 
Yeah, you look. So I just want to throw a bone into this conversation, I guess. So I, I remember something of the point you said at, at the Minnesota Political College Conference a few years ago, where there's so much energy for this program, right, this knowledge. But the few folks who do it have to do everything, and she's tired. Yeah. You know? And I'm curious to an extent, right, you're still making the case for Bobby Wilson, and, you're, and people are giving him awards after he died, you know? So I'm, I'm curious to what extent it's desirable to be a part of geography. To what extent is it meaningful to incorporate the black imagination into the draft imagination? And if it is desirable, to what end? And I think about this with Catherine Pendrick's work because, and um, Christina Sharp's work too. Um, to some extent, it's not desirable to be a part of the human sometimes, you know, because you get implicated in all these complicated ways. And I'm curious to hear, you know, your thoughts as the one black geographer up there, um, not for anyone's you know reasons other than travels and things, but it is poetic. Um, <laughs> it, it is. What do you think about the, comp the the tension, the generative tension, but the tension nonetheless between the geographic imagination and the black imagination, and is, is incorporating them? Is it still a desirable project? And if it is, then why? That's, that is a good existential question, <laughs> and it is. It is a question to which I, and I don't want to get too mushy here, but, you know, this is a question to which I've had to attend myself because I got hired in a sociology department, and so I've been, you know, maybe in exile, you could say, or a deportation um, in a sociology department. So this is actually something I, I do think about. To what extent do I want to return to geography? Um, and I don't know that I have a perfect answer or even a coherent one because it is, it's like not like a question, it's like my life. Like, I'm going to go home next week to go back to a sociology department. Um, but if I were to try to answer that in a way that like, is relevant <coughs> for, for conversation, I would say that in the same way that Bobby, who is far more important and impactful to this thing called geography than I am, decided to remain in it, that I think for a lot of us, whether it's Latoya, whether it's Catherine, whether it's Clyde, whether it's Ruth Wilson Gilmore, uh, whether it's any of the other emerging people, Camila Hawthorne, whether it's Tiana Bruno, who was supposed to be here, whether it's Alison Guest, whether it's, you know, um, who else, anyone else, right? That the, the promise of geography for us is not always the sort of disciplinary, you know, sort of promise but it is that geography provides for us a really important framework to make sense of our lives. Not in a me studies kind of way, but Ruth Wilson Gilmore says that uh, placemaking is a normal part of human existence, and that abolition is making freedom of it. It's making, or placemaking practices make sense and have value. And to the extent that that is geography, and of course we have to be committed to this because we have people who are non-dominant people have a whole lot riding on realizing abolition, realizing spaces that we can be and flourish. And so if, if that is geography, then I've got to be committed to it. Um, we've, had, we've faced many difficulties organizing this panel, uh, last minute cancellations, logistics, etc. Uh, even Alex on the way here, <laughs> he's trying to fire, I think? Or what other? Anyway. There were, yeah, there was fire. There was fire involved. So at some point, we thought that this panel was jeans. But having Alex here so thoughtfully uh, summarizing that there is hope in the field, I think is helping us to break the course. So thank you so much, Alex, for being here. Thank you.